Well, I'm going to get started by saying hello to everyone here. We're waiting for Miriam Azarm to make an introduction before we get started in full. But my name is Doug White. And Miriam, do we have you? Can yet? we start? Yes, we can. Yes, Please do. <laughs> now, yes. Hello, everyone. Apart from I, we have a few technological problems here with um, some of our computers. But anyway, let's start. Um, just that so you know, I can't hear any of you. So I'm hoping that you can hear me. Please not. <laughs> okay. So, Doug, apart from your illustrious academic career as a, as a lecturer, you've been a leader in the philanthropic community. You've always strived to integrate ethics into the purpose and promise of our nation's charities as exemplified in the many books you have authored. Today, you work closely with select organizations on ethical decision-making, board governance, and fundraising, as well as individual philanthropists who want to see their gifts used more effectively. This panel was an inspiration to me, thanks to the great leadership of Doug, which I recognized during the Donors' Breakfast Forums. Also recognizing the work of exceptional people in philanthropic organizations during my years at the United Nations. My friend, Dr. Joan LaRiviere is amongst them, and I'm privileged to have asked Doug to, re to represent his illustrious network to join forces in this endeavor. Again, Doug, I'm so grateful to you for <laughs> accepting this last minute invitation at short, such short notice, so I give you the floor now. Miriam, thank you so much. It's really good to be here with you and all of our panelists and everyone who's tuning in. This panel is especially important to me because it's about philanthropy. At Horasis, there are so many panels. This is about philanthropy, where we are right now in the world of COVID and where we are going to go in a post-COVID world and how we're going to get there. And so this is way, the way we began uh, thinking about this a few uh, weeks ago. And it started to take form just last week. And I was able to get some very, very talented, very experienced people in the world of philanthropy to join us in this conversation. Philanthropy is driven by a very basic human quality, a sense of altruism, a sense that in one way or another is ingrained in each of us. Over the years, philanthropy has grown from general giving to more targeted donations and programs, programs that are now measured for their long-term impact and effectiveness. In this era of cloud computing, geospatial mapping, and artificial intelligence, it seems now time to make data more available as a means to increase efficiency in our drive to do good. That is, the question is, can we better match resources with needs? The idea is this, data-driven decisions can yield the highest impact for philanthropists to accelerate and realize their good intentions in their quest to make the world a better place? That's the age old question. How do we make the world a better place? With us today, Roberta Destachio, the founder of The Giving Collective, Kate Bain, the managing director of Charity Intelligence Canada, Jim Rendon, reporter and senior writer for The Chronicle of Philanthropy, and Dr. Joan Leverovere, the co founder of Virtue Foundation. I'd like to begin by asking each of you a little bit about your work in philanthropy and how you came to where you are in the world of philanthropy. And then we'll, we'll start to have some questions and answers uh, back and forth among us about uh, philanthropy in the COVID world and in a post COVID world and how we're going to integrate uh, artificial intelligence and other technologies into a, a new world of philanthropy. I would love to begin with you, Roberta. Good afternoon to you and welcome. Hi there, Doug. It's good to be with you. I don't know whether anyone else can see me, but perhaps they can hear me, correct? We can hear you. I know that some of our panel can see you and some cannot. So it depends, I guess, on the configuration on the screen for some people. Okay, I will do my best with my voice, okay? Um, okay, philanthropy. Um, I started out uh, as a poet and then a playwright. And then I inherited a music festival. This is a long, long time ago, um, which put me in a position to raise money from individuals to keep it going. 
Uh, I did that for a while, and then I thought, well, if I could do it for this organization that I inherited, I could do it for multiple organizations. So I became, I became a fundraiser just to get and understand why people give. From that, I said, you know what? Philanthropists themselves don't have their own magazine. They get bits and pieces from here and there, but there's no one source. So I founded the American Benefactor, raised $10 million to get it to market. Then I started the giving magazine and put it online and started traveling the world, okay, to find out what was happening in philanthropy in England, Australia, Europe, South America, everywhere. Very, very different. It woke me up that we are a global community and many individuals don't have some knowledge that, that we have. So formed the collective, the Giving Collective, and in the process, working with media companies around the world to do stories that would be translated into 13 languages. Then the pandemic came along and it sort of threw me into a room talking to people on Zoom. So that's where I am right now and that's who I am. I'm glad to be here and can't wait to hear everybody's story. I have a question before we move on, Roberta. Part of your experience involves Dame Stephanie Shirley. Could you take yes. uh, about 30 seconds to tell us? Sure. About um, I guess about 22 years ago, um, I had made a lot of connections in London and BBC asked me to be, you know, be part of a conversation. And then Dame Stephanie Shirley was on that conversation from London. I was in New York. And I just said, oh, my gosh, who is this woman? She was at then she was about 75. She had started a, um, a tech company in the 60s when she had to get permission from her husband to open a bank account. OK, she took it public. She was giving away over 100 million dollars at the time. And so then we were on the BBC together. And she said, when you come to London, that's let's get together. Let's do some projects together. So we started projects. She called one time and says, let's raise a billion dollars for autism. I said, OK, I'll be right over. Um, and then Gordon Brown, the prime minister at the time, asked her to be the ambassador for philanthropy for the for Great Britain and uh, the UK. Um, so I became her chief of staff. And literally, we, we, we traveled the world. Um, and it was fantastic. And today, she's giving, at this time, a speech in well, not on Zoom, but for Edinburgh. Okay, so she's she's 88 now and going like like she's 22. Okay, she and she's fantastic. So she's like a, I guess she's like a mentor, but 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 also, you know, she wants me to tell her, you know, when she writes something, that's not really good enough. You know, she wants me to tell her the truth. She's fantastic, and I recommend if you don't know her, in Stephanie Shirley. Thank you for that. Uh, we need more uh, philanthropy ambassadors around the world. So that, <laughs> she was a good first one. Yes. Kate, we're going to move on to you. Kate Bain at Charity Intelligence Canada. Tell us about your background. Hi, Doug. Um, well, Canada is a small country. If you think about all the people in Canada, we don't even add up to the population of California. So when it comes to the podium, Canadians are never going to be the biggest givers in the world. So with that, we sort of thought, rather than being the biggest, how can we be the best givers in the world? How can what we afford to give, how can we make sure that our giving does the most good possible? And that's where Charity Intelligence was founded back in 2007. And we do research and analysis on charities, and we measure impact, and we run a website. So I know that many philanthropists We'll, um, we'll, we'll have in-house research and analysis and impact measurement. But we're like the outhouse. We just put all of our information online so it's accessible to a donor who's maybe giving $100 or $1,000, so that, that sort of smaller donor. So you can sort of think of that like a Ford versus Ferrari. We're going with, with the Model T Ford model. And this, this discussion today is critical because with COVID, we're going to be seeing individual giving collapsing 
by about 25 to 35 percent. When people lose their jobs, you know, at the end of the at the end of the day, giving is a discretionary item. So there's going to be a, a reckoning in the charitable sector on that. So today, more than ever, donors need to use data, need to use evidence-based um, information to make informed giving decisions that's going to have the biggest impact. It sounds a little bit like you're doing the kind of work that organizations here in the United States do to evaluate charities. Would you call yourself a charity evaluator or is it more than that? No, absolutely. So in, in the States, being such a big country, uh, Americans have Charity Navigator with its star ratings and Charity Watch with its deep dive on uh, financial analysis and also Give Well on the West Coast in San Francisco doing impact measurement and its top 10 lists. So in Canada, with sort of the sort of three in one stop, uh, at Charity Intelligence, we'd have the star ratings on over 780 charities, most of the big name household brand names, but about 25% would be small cap. We do the financial analysis on all charities using audited financial statements. And then we do the impact measurement as well. As we go forward to talk about data here, I'll be very interested to hear how you do your work relative to how other people are doing theirs because we are in a new world and part of it is because of your work. Jim, you are from the Chronicle of Philanthropy, a writer, a senior writer there. I've known the Chronicle for 30 plus years. It's basically the go-to for nonprofit leaders here in the United States and in many parts of the world. Welcome and tell us a little bit about your work at the Chronicle and with philanthropy. Great, thanks Doug. Um, yeah, so I've been at the Chronicle for, uh, about a year and a half, a little bit more. Um, I cover leadership. I cover racial equity, which has been a huge issue here in the U.S. Um, in the nonprofit sector. Um, I write accountability stories. We have a whole series we're doing kind of looking at philanthropic big bets and, and going back and trying to evaluate and, and see how those are panning out and what lessons might be learned. That's sort of a new project we're just getting going. Um, and uh, I, I'm really enjoying it. Um, you know, philanthropy and, and the nonprofit space is very undercovered, uh, at least here in the U.S., and it's a wonderful place to be as a reporter. You get a lot of room to, to work on stories um, without too many other people breathing down your neck. Um, and uh, it's a great place to learn. I mean, there's just it, it's, a, it's sort of a world unto itself with a lot to understand. Um, prior to coming to um, Chronicle Philanthropy, I was a freelance writer for about 10 years. I wrote for the New York Times Magazine and the New York Times, uh, Fortune, um, Wall Street Journal, Marie Claire. I did a lot of long form writing. Um, I wrote two books, um, one of which was, is about um, trauma and positive change. It's called it's about post traumatic growth. So it's looking at the sort of suffering that people go through as a result of trauma and how that forces a, a kind of reckoning and, and reimagining of one's life and future and, and how people want to move forward. And actually in doing that book, I spoke to um, uh, many, many people who went through traumatic experience and founded nonprofit organizations. And I've been um, very interested to see as I do this work, how many groups were funded out of a personal traumatic experience. So there are very interesting ties between some of the areas I've done a lot of research on in psychology and uh, the nonprofit space. For example, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, that kind of organization. Yes, exactly. As a woman who lost her child to a drunk driver who then went on to found an advocacy group. Um, you know, I've reported on uh, cancer, a young adult cancer survivor uh, who had cancer twice in her early 20s who went on to found a group to help um, young adult cancer patients with expenses, um, you know, uh, um, other folks who have founded nonprofits that, um, you know, do a lot of work with veterans and, and um, global um, uh, hunger and poverty, a, a whole range of issues that people will find that they are um, really wanting to help with. And a big part of post-traumatic growth is, is a move towards altruism. And you really see that through, through many of these folks. I can't imagine a more fitting way to frame this conversation than the words you've just used, trauma and challenge and opportunity and altruism. There's a through line there. Let's go to that through line in part by going to Joan, Joan La Rovere, who comes to us from Boston. 
She's the co-founder of Virtue Foundation and also is at Boston's Children's Hospital. And so when we say Dr. La Rovere, we mean medical doctor. Welcome to our group today. Welcome, Joan. I hope you can. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. I um, I missed the, the the last couple words of what you said, but it's uh, wonderful to be here. And um, they were all positive. Yes, I've, I've, I've been in the the front lines of COVID myself in the intensive care. So um, yeah, it's been an interesting time. I guess to just to carry on from those words of sort of major events and, and bringing forth altruism. I, that, that's where Virtue Foundation came from, is out of the events of 9-11. I mean, another major time for our, our country here in the United States. And uh, the name came from those basic human virtues that you saw really in people in, in New York and across the country as a response to those times. So I, I agree that I think this, this time of COVID is gonna change so much in ways we can't imagine for our world going forward from, from here. And um, God willing, we see more of the altruism and the goodness in people and in the philanthropic space coming out of it. I appreciate your emphasizing the word altruism. Mm -hmm. I always try to find that in donors and it's always there, it comes in different forms. Um, but we also, on top of altruism, or parallel to that feeling of doing good things for other people, uh, we want to be intelligent about that. And uh, the world has changed in the last few years, last few decades at, at least, and I've seen more and more philanthropists who are interested in how their work is being measured and how charities do that work and what kind of outcomes those charities can be responsible for. Tell us a little bit about what the Virtue Foundation's perspective is on that particular issue. Uh, yes, it's an honor to, to speak about that. Um, for my personal um, philanthropy, it, it's really born of my profession in healthcare and a lot of on the ground work in, in medical missions around the globe. Uh, the foundation works in other areas in education and empowerment, both access to just, justice and economic empowerment. But I want to focus on the healthcare piece today. And um, one of my colleagues and partners, Dr. Ebi Elahi, had the, really this brilliant idea as we were going on all of these um, trips and working, why can't we have better access to information on the ground ahead of um, going on site? And why can't we make that more available to others in the world? Particularly as we've moved into this era of cloud computing, AI, machine learning. And it's taken us about 10 years to get from that idea to a platform that's launching with a book on December 1st. Um, it's, it's hard work trying to gather information and data on the ground in low and middle income countries, and then try to present that geospatially. And what we have tried to do is, as a, a first layer of this platform, is to identify all of the hospitals and major healthcare centers, and to start with in 24 low-income countries, as well as all of the healthcare NGOs working in that space. And I think we have probably the largest and most curated list because it's all been pulled through machine learning and AI and then curated by senior clinicians and others with expertise in the field to really try to do our best in validating those organizations. And I think being able to have access to that information is vital. Our next phase is for the supply side of this equation, the healthcare philanthropists, both uh, clinicians and others who can actually work on the ground. And I also think for donors, this platform will be very interesting because you'll be able a location. I think we lost you for a second there, but you're back on, so go right ahead. Uh, you will be able to target to a location and an area you're particularly interested in, whether that's eye care or cardiac surgery or um, fistula repair or safe delivery. And you can see who is doing good work on the ground and where they're doing it. I'm going to ask the other panelists uh, about how their experiences would meld in with what you're saying. 
But let me further ask you a question about AI. Can you give us a specific example of how AI or donor mapping can help us in the world of coronavirus? Is there something that we can say, this is what philanthropy is doing? I can give you an example. From, Go ahead. I can give you an example from myself. Um, we have a, a, a deep map of Ghana. And the north of Ghana has had terrible problems with under five mortality and um, very poor access to ventilators or oxygen. And we were able to take this data and be able to look on the ground. And from my ICU in Boston, I would be via WhatsApp communicating with the district health director, the hospital directors and clinicians on the ground and getting oxygen in place into the health centers to get a better ventilation program up in their district hospital. So we're able to use real time data and be able to work with both ourselves and some partner organizations on the ground to implement based on knowing where, where things are located and where the need is. A tangible perspective there. Thank you for and that. And they were able to really be able to get ahead of the Yeah. Super. Let me, let me go back now and ask some of the other panelists uh, to react to what you've just said. Roberta, yeah. can you chime in on, on what Jones just provided with us and meld that with some of your own experiences uh, in the world of philanthropy? I think her story and what she's created with her team is very unique. I don't, I'm not quite sure it can be compared, Doug. I mean, I'm really sitting here listening as we were yesterday, um, and I find it extremely exciting and interesting and think that the more her story gets out, again, we have the story has to get out, the more, especially on the tech side, I'm not going to rule other people out at all, but there's going to be heavy excitement here, okay? Um, but, but my question is, If you can do this, why haven't governments come together and done this? This is, I mean, if you know what I mean? So, so my question is, why did it take so long? You know, I mean, I'm a little upset. <laughs> well, you're not upset at Joan. You're just not upset, upset at Joan. No, I'm yeah. delighted for Joan. <laughs> but the thing is, why? Why hasn't let's, this been done? That's my let, question. Let's go to Joan. Please answer that, and then I'll go back to the other panelists for their comments as well. But what, what, what do you say to that uh, question from Roberta? Well, sometimes things that are obvious are hard, and they're not yes. uh, often obvious until you actually see it. I can't tell you how many philanthropists we went out and pitched this idea to, and it took a while for people to get their head around it. And I think the combination of where we are in a, a tech world with all the big tech companies and the matching platforms that we're used to using with you know, Uber, for example, every day, now people can understand that, I think, the concept better. And I think the COVID crisis has made, I think a lot of people realize how vital this information is for all of us and how really connected we all are. When something can happen in one place and affect another, it's really important that we have this information and that we help others with this information. But it's been hard. We have used a lot of man hours to curate through this and validate algorithms and rerun them. It's pretty labor intensive. Thank you for that. Uh, Jim or Kate, let me go to you, Jim, and ask you first. Um, you're on the ground talking to charities. You wrote a, a fairly long piece this past week on the, uh, in the Chronicle about how charities are changing uh, in response to coronavirus. What, what, what's your response to what Joan is saying and bring some perspective as to how you, what you've learned with the people you've Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a fantastic project. I mean, I, I, I love it. it. It sounds like it's really filling a need and has a real potential to um, just boost the effectiveness of, of health efforts uh, across many, many countries. Um, you know, I would say that from what I'm seeing here in the U.S., um, there is a real technology gap for nonprofits. Um, you know, I'm actually working on a piece now and, and looking at some data from a few different organizations that are surveying. And, you know, one of them, an organization called Hope Lab, just did a survey. They found that 
Um, 75% of the groups they surveyed said that they did not have any funders that would fund technology for them. Um, a similar percentage um, was lacking any digital strategy, strategy whatsoever. About 60% had no um, C-level employees responsible for technology. Um, you know, with so much of philanthropy funding um, programs, uh, technology has, I think, for a very, very long time been just kind of patched together and kind of just make it work as best you can on a shoestring budget. And um, it's a real hole. And I think it's one that, frankly, the COVID crisis really brought to the forefront. You know, basically within a week, everybody was kicked out of their offices, and had to close their doors and all of a sudden to figure out how to work from home with each other and provide services virtually and do a million things in a completely different way, relying almost entirely on digital technology. And um, it really highlighted gaps for a lot of organizations. I think there are also um, questions around racial equity, you know, our reporting um, on lots of surveys and, and other great research by other organizations really shows that um, organizations that serve people of color, organizations led by people of color have fewer resources than those led by white people and technology costs money and they are not often able to have the kind of technological resources and digital strategy and the space and time to really do that work and get up to speed in a way that will make them effective. And, and you know, sometimes there is a real negative spiral, right? If you don't have the technology infrastructure to track your programs and provide the data and be on that level, then philanthropy may not be as interested in the work that you're doing because you can't provide the metrics that are required to get through the door to the larger funders and to get the money in that you need to build the technology platforms to provide the data. So, um, you know, it, I don't think it's all gloom and doom. I think for many um, grant makers, the, the COVID crisis has really highlighted this. And there is apparently, there's some movement among foundations, I think, to start targeting this, to start providing even services, licenses to Zoom, for example, and Slack and other tools that just help people to work better remotely. So I think, you know, the crisis has provided an, a, a bit of a, just shown a light on this problem in a way that we haven't really seen before. And I think that there is, um, you know, some responsiveness and some sense of, of sort of really seeing this and understanding that something needs to be done. So maybe we're at a bit of a turning point for that as well. I don't know if you could have teed it up any better for the question I'm going to ask or will ask of Kate. But before I do, Joan, do you have a comment back to Jim from what he's just said? Yes, I, I would. I would totally agree that trying to get investment in tech is a hard, a hard sell to a donor. But I think that you know when you start to see this, you realize, okay, funding for an individual trip to help is really important as part of a bigger ecosystem. And if we can create that bigger platform through this platform, I feel like thousands or tens of thousands or maybe even you know more lives are impacted just as this launches in a way that you know it, it's a it's a magnitude of scale and i think that it's harder to get that in investment up front but i think once once you do you realize more lives are impacted there's more benefit and it's it's a it's a, it's stronger more efficient philanthropy and without that tech it's hard to deliver on it let me go now to Kate. You have just heard Joan respond to Jim and you heard what Jim had to say about measurements and what people are expecting. What do you have to say about what Joan is doing and also what you think philanthropists should be looking at? And I should also remind you that yesterday we talked about a lot of things among ourselves in anticipation of today. And you were telling us about charities that are very well run and yet are small and not known. How do we get through that thicket. Yeah. I was going to say that, I mean, with, with, with COVID, and let's just be honest, maybe the whole philanthropy sector got a little bit frothy before this you know, sharp, abrupt COVID crash. And what we've seen in Canada with donors is, yes, giving overall is down because of unemployment and the COVID shutdown, 
but 11% of donors have changed their giving in just the last six months. Mm -hmm. And they're switching from what we call the SOBs, the symphonies, the operas, the ballets, and they're switching to food banks, women's shelters, the basic necessities, which is uh, for, for many people in philanthropy is not an area that they've normally given at this size in. So I think that's what's one of the positives. To, to Jim's point, um, I think this is going to be belt tightening for, for the charity sector. And data and technology can be a tool in improving your productivity so that you can do more with less. And I think maybe the, the, the sector had become a little bit you know, asset heavy, um, a little bit out of date, out of step. And you, you need to embrace technology not just to report to donors your metrics as some sort of compliance exercise, but to actually embrace technology so that you can run your programs, you can track your clients, you can make sure that your programs are relevant and you know, are actually improving the results for those you, you help. Um, and yes, with the old system, let's say pre-COVID, it was really a competition of who was the best fundraiser, got the most money. And obviously, it was the hospital foundations. It's the biggest charities on the block that, that can win that game. But when you switch to a um, data analytics and an intensive research, and you're looking not at who brings in the most money, but the bottom line results of a charity in terms of helping people, that's when you can see small charities off the beaten track may be unknown to some donors. And on a level playing field, those can be your star performers with some of the biggest impact we've seen. So I recognize that there's a pushback to data and I recognize that many people aren't comfortable about using research and you know hard facts to make what is typically an emotional decision. But when you make that transformation, um, we just have donors who are funding charities that they've never heard of before. And just like, I didn't know this even existed. And what a sensational charity this is. So one of the great joys is to see small charities um, come to the attention of some of the biggest foundations and watch their growth as they grow. I'm glad you put it that way, Kate, because I see you and Joan here on a, on a, on a plane and I'm going to ask Roberta to jump in with a comment about the role data analytics plays in the context of what you just said a moment ago, our altruism is driven by our emotions, by our heartstrings. And we can look at a spreadsheet and not feel the same heartstring being pulled. So Roberta, do you have a response to, to the question or the idea that uh, analytics is uh, becoming more and more in the forefront of our philanthropic decision making. Uh, it is a big question, and not a and it's not a and it's a large answer. Um, every individual is, is different. Okay, um, some people might you know feel good about learning more about technology within organizations and how the technology helps that organization move forward, et cetera. But others would have no interest at all, okay, in, in the technology. Um, that's, that's, it just depends on individuals and their own, and their own interests. So mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm, you know, I, I don't think you, I think the future holds that Yes, because so many people use technology that they will want to read the data. But in the end, it, it, the, some emotion or mindset will drive that person to that particular organization. Okay. Um, there's what, six or seven organized organizations, nonprofits around the world, meaningful groups around the world, another 10 million, you know, that are not organized as nonprofits. There's, there's just so much uh, that I think, yes, the technology and what the doctor is doing, fantastic. And uh, she should have 
funds coming in without even asking if, if you know, <laughs> people that I know uh, would be, I'm in, you know, would, would love what she's doing. But um, it's just such a big question that I can't answer it. Sorry. I understand. And it's an unfair question with just a few <laughs> moments left. And it's not quite the right format. But I wanted to hear your view on this because you always have good, interesting perspectives on things. I'm hearing this to be, I hear a couple of things emerging here. One is that during the coronavirus, we have a big project that many charities around the world are trying to attack from their different perspectives. But I'm also hearing that this idea, more generically, is one that's going to outlive the coronavirus in the United States and in the world, and that we're still going to need to, to do the work that Joan is describing. And I said that in the third person, Joan, because you disappeared on me for just a second. There you are. Okay. And so um, in the last few minutes here, I'd love to have everybody just weigh in for maybe uh, 45 seconds or so. And I'll start with you, Joan. Uh, is this too big for, for foundations or charities? Or does there need to be more of a, a handshake with, with government and business? In terms of... Um Building a platform like this? Yes, yes. Not a, I know that we can't solve the coronavirus or the COVID question all alone, but I mean, in terms of the platform and what you're trying to accomplish from a process perspective. I think that this is a process perspective we're going to see more of, and and we we should do. Um, I, I just can't see us not going in this direction of being able to have more geospatial information, real time, granular, so that you can see what's happening at a country level. And I think for NGOs, this is a wonderful opportunity because all of their work is showcased. It's not one organization or another. And you can see where they are and what they're doing and connect with it because altruism at the end of the day is deeply personal. But um, this will, I think, allow somebody to use their altruism in a way that's meaningful for them based on real information in real locations. And I think it allows some of these smaller organizations that are doing tremendous focused work in a particular area to be showcased. I personally have learned so much about so many other organizations that I hope Virtue Foundation will be partnering with because I can see how we could amplify our work by collaborating with them. I would not know, have known about them. There's no single place to go to find me, this type of information. Let me ask you this, though. Roberta just said something that was very interesting. Um, are you uh, able to raise money without asking for it? <laughs> well, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect really matter. would like to find mm -hmm. uh, okay. a big donor who would like to help us take this on to other other layers from here. I, I think this publication with Taylor and Francis in uh, uh, 1st of December and the release online live of the platform, I okay. think is going to be a real turning point for others to really see the level of the work that we've done. Now, in the last minute, and I mean that, Kate, any last thought? Well, I'm not a very big fan of government design software, so I'd, uh, <laughs> we've, we, we've got some of that up here in Canada where our government does a lot, and uh, I actually much prefer using Apple products or Google products when it comes to those types of things. Um, I, I just, I'm excited. This is the information age, and this is just, just the beginning, and I believe that information and data clouds and sharing of information is just going to be one of the biggest innovations in the charity sector and also for donors in giving over the next you know 15 20 years so COVID has accelerated that but this is just the beginning thank you and 10 seconds jim yeah, um, very quickly, I, I think it would be fantastic. I think it just requires a shift in how grant makers think about what the needs are at nonprofit organizations and really just to focus on helping them with um, with their tech. Thank you, Jim, Roberta, Kate, and Dr. Joan. I appreciate it. I think we've had a great time. I wish we had more. Have a good day and thank everyone who has joined us today. Thanks thank so much. much. Thank you, Dad. Bye-bye.